We have been looking at a lesson or several lessons titled, Do We Really Believe the Bible? Because while many people claim to believe the Bible, they in reality don't. Uh, Jesus addresses people of his day that told them, search the scriptures. Uh, They are they which testify of me, he tells them. But you won't come to me so that you can have life. They didn't really believe the scriptures, even though these Jews claimed to believe such. Well, there's a lot of people today who claim to believe the Bible, but when it comes down to it, they don't really believe the Bible. We've noticed several things in this afternoon. I wanted to notice the aspect of stealing. Man has the right of private property. Now, when I say that, there is the knowledge and the we should realize that God owns everything. Everything belongs to Him by right of creation. He is God. He is the Creator. And thus, it does belong to Him. And so there is that aspect that we are not ignoring, but as far as we are concerned, we do have the right of private property. Every once in a while we come across those who want to claim that there should be communism and that the New Testament church practiced communism. Well, that's not true. Uh, As there's some very basic differences between what communism was and what the New Testament church practiced. They practiced a free will giving of their things to others for the good of everyone. Communism is not like that. And and when we come to uh, chapter 5 of Acts, well, go back to chapter 4 first in this. Uh, Verse 34 of chapter 4 talks about there there was no, no one lacked anything For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of things that were sold and laid it down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made to every man according according as he had need. And they claim that this is the communistic approach. Well, no, it's not. Not in reality, but that's another lesson. Uh, This was something which they did. It was their free will offering. And we see that in chapter 5 when you have Ananias and his wife Sapphira. It says in verse 1, they they sold a possession. So they went out, sold a possession. Notice it's a possession, not all of their possessions. Communism demands everything. That they say everything belongs to the state. You don't own anything. Well, they sold a possession. How did they sell a possession if they didn't own it? In fact, uh, Peter is going to specify that. Um, But what they did, verse 2, they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter says to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now notice this, though, and this is where we want to deal with as to the right of private property. He says, While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing and lie in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. As long as it was yours, you had that right. It was yours. It was thine own. That piece of property or whatever it was that they sold, that possession that they sold, it was theirs by right of possession. It was their own. After they sold it. 
the money that they received from that sale of that possession was in their own power. Why? Because it belonged to them. It was their private property. The reason Ananias and Sapphira were condemned is that they wanted the prestige and the, thus the recognition that they were giving everything from the sale of this possession. In other words, let's just put it, uh, use an illustration. They had this possession, they sold it for $500. And they came and they brought $250 to the apostles and said, here's the money for the sale of this possession. As if they had sold the possession for $250 instead of $500. And then they were going to keep $250 for themselves, but get the recognition of selling it for $500. Or for the entire amount. That that's all, the entire amount we sold it for. When in reality they didn't. Their sin was lying to the Holy Spirit. Not the keeping back part of the land, or part of the possession. If they had kept back part of the possession and admitted such, that would have been fine. Because it was in thine own power, as Peter puts it. It was your right. It was your possession. The idea of communism, in reality, stands in total opposition to God. and It needs to be opposed in every way. Stealing, though, is the taking of another's property without permission or the legal right to do so and without intending to return it. Consider some situations. And we don't, a lot of times we don't discuss stealing from the standpoint of a lot of situations that arise. But consider you're given too much change by this uh, clerk over here after making a buy of something. And do we give it back or do we keep it? Well, when we keep it, we're stealing. Or we find something, maybe a you know, piece of property or something. It might be some money, some goods. Do we try to find who it belongs to? Or do we work under the premise of finders, keepers, losers, weepers? As we heard when I was growing up a whole lot. Or you start taking small items from work. It might be a little item. I mean, they're never going to miss it anyway. Or do we do personal activities on the job? And we realize when we say these things that sometimes there are agreements in place for certain things and others not to take place. And that's fine because that's in the agreement with the, the employee, the employer and the employee. Taking sick days when you're not sick. And again, there's sometimes agreements in place. And then those things are fine. But when those agreements are not in place, then is it right? Have you not stolen from the employer? Stealing, though, is a violation of the law. In Exodus, the 20th chapter in the Ten Commandments, 15th verse says, Thou shalt not steal. I mean, really you can't put it in much clearer language than that. Thou shalt not steal. We come into the New Testament, and Ephesians 4th chapter and verse 28 st states, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that the thing which is good, that he may have good have to give to him that needeth. That individual who stole, steal no more. Uh, some, in making a joke about the subject of stealing, want, uh, 
have changed the language, or actually the way in which that would be worded, to let him that stole steal. No more working with his hands. Well, that's, of course, not what's intended, but uh, it was a good way to remember it, though. Let him that stole steal no more. Because that's the command. You steal no more. Stealing is a violation of loyalty. As an employee, the scriptures teach us in Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8, in relationship to servants and master relationship of the Old Testament or the New Testament times, the servants be obedient to them who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as in the Christ. <clears throat> not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Someone's alarm is... <laughs> Yes, I know, it's uh, emergency alarms. And even, <laughs> even if we have it, them turned on silent, they still come through a lot of times. So, and if I, get, if I escape it, I'll be surprised. It'll probably come on through mine in a minute. So. But notice, um, there is a loyalty to the employee, employer in this situation, in this, servants and masters, and that the servants are to work in, not with eye service, in other words, the, if you want to put it in master-slave relationship, the master comes along and the slave gets real busy and works real hard until he gets out of sight, and after he gets out of sight, he quits his work again. Not with eye service. But as men, play, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God, you're working as unto the Lord. In fact, in Colossians the third chapter, that's what he likens it to. Colossians three verse twenty two and twenty three: Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Uh, we use that verse a lot of times in other contexts, but the context really is dealing with that master-slave relationship. We make an application, proper application, to employer-employee relationship, and that you work diligently for them. You do your work as, well, heartily, as unto the Lord. But let's turn it around. The employer also has a responsibility to that employee. In Ephesians 6 and verse 9. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. There is <coughs> neither is there respect to persons with him. Now then he's just gone through how the servant is to be in relationship to his master and now then the master do the same thing to the servant. There needs to be a loyalty there on the, on the part of both. In Colossians 4 and verse 1 Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. You don't steal from them. Knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. And so even from <coughs> that stamp <coughs> even from that standpoint, you do that which just and equal. You don't try to take advantage of them. That's stealing. There's a loyalty that should be there on the part of the employer, even as on the part of the employee. And both of them have a responsibility one to the other to do that which is right for the other. 
Now that's in relationship, and we make a proper application to the types of situations we are in today with an employer and employee. There's a loyalty that should be there that you do the best that you can for your employer and the employer treats the employee in a proper way. To do otherwise is to try to cheat them or to steal from them. And so from that employer-employee relationship there is that aspect of we're not to steal. But also in our ethics, borrowing something and never returning it. Well, that's a way of stealing. You've stolen that item that you borrowed permanently. Or the honoring of our debts. In Romans 15 and, or 13 and verse 8, Paul writes, To owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. That does not mean that you cannot ever take out a debt and thus owe someone. But the, when you take that debt out, and if it's a monthly charge that you have to pay, you pay that debt. Because when you fail to pay the debt, you're stealing from that person that you have taken the money from. And so, there's the honoring of our debts. But what about cheating on taxes? Oh, no, that's not stealing. I mean, that's the government. So you can't, you're not supposed to, you know, you, Christ himself paid taxes and taught us to. In Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 17 through verse 21, there's a situation of the, the uh, Herodians coming to Jesus. Is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar or not? And says, Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought him a penny. And he said unto them, Whose image in Whose is this image and, and subscription? And they say unto him, Caesar. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Jesus is teaching you pay the taxes. Because that's really what the Herodians are asking. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And he's saying, yes, you pay your taxes. When we take money under the, you know, under the table so that we don't have to report that money to the internal revenue, then we're cheating the government. We're stealing. In Matthew, the 17th chapter, Jesus himself paid the tax that was due even though he points out, in reality, he should be exempt from it, but yet he pays it. Look at verse 24 through verse 28 of Matthew 17. That when they were come to Capernaum, they, <clears throat> they that received tribute, that's taxes, money, came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And then when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? And Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus said unto them, Then are the children free? Now then, he being the child of God, and thus creator, by him were all things created, he by right had the right to be free from any taxes, is what he's pointing out. Then are the children free. But verse 27, he says, Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou into the sea, cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That take, and give to them for me and thee. So... 
this miracle of the coin in the mouth of the fish. You get, take that money, you take it to the tax collector, and you pay the taxes for me and for you. Now, why would he do the, that? Because it's right to pay taxes, and he expects us to pay our taxes. Now, in our government and in our system of taxation, we have, there are deductions allowed and credits and all of these other things. We should pay every cent that we owe, but there's no need to pay one cent more than we owe. In other words, it's right because our government allows such to take every deduction, every credit, and every other thing that we can in order to reduce our taxes, but we better not take more than what we owe. We're supposed to. And we pay that which we owe. But stealing is also a violation of love. In our contribution upon the first day of the week, While we're no longer subject to the old law, and we realize that, and we're not subject to the tithing, we do not tithe. That was an Old Testament practice. It's not in relationship to the church. Yet, what, the, what sort of things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15 and verse 4. And so let's look at Malachi chapter 3 and and verses 8 through verse 10. Because Malachi asked the people, the Jews of his day, will a man rob God? Isn't that stealing? Except stealing from God now. And then he says, yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. You've robbed me, God says, in your tithes and in your offerings. Now then, you bring those, and I'll open up the blessings of heaven. But the fact is, they had not brought God what was rightfully His, the tithes and the offerings. As a result of not offering to Him what was his due, then they robbed God. We'll make an application today. God has blessed us. God has prospered us. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and verse 2, when Paul talks about now the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lie by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. God has prospered us. We are to give to God that which, based upon what he has given us and what he has prospered us. What if I don't do that? Then what's the difference between when God required 10%, the tithe? And they did not bring all that of that tithe. They didn't bring all of the offerings. And God says, you have robbed me. Would we not be robbing God if we don't give as he has prospered us? If not, why not? Don't we learn the principle that's found there in Malachi 3 as to those people robbing God? And what we are to do? Now then, that's not to say there's any specific percentage by which we are, God expects us to give. But God does expect us to give, and we are obligated to give as He has prospered us. We find a great deal of that 
would be in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verses 6 and verse 7, when <clears throat> Paul says, uh, but he... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but this I say, that he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for, it, uh, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. That's what we are to be. But he says here in regards to that, sowing bountifully, not sparingly. The sowing there would be in relationship to our giving. We give bountifully, and thus we will receive bountifully. I think the great illustration of that is in St. Corinthians 8. And the first five verses, really, where Paul is trying to encourage the church at Corinth to go ahead and give the money that they have, they have talked about giving. And he talks about, here's the churches of Macedonia. And in verse 2, he mentions how the, in great trial of affliction, the abundance of joy, and their deep poverty. Now, we would say, here's people that are dirt poor. And yet it abounded because of the, their abundance of joy. It abounded to the riches of their liberality. And he says, for to their power I bear record. So here's their ability. Here's what their ability was. To their power and beyond their power. So they went beyond what their ability was to give. I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. So they gave not just to their power, their ability, in their deep poverty, but they went beyond that. And then prayed Paul with much entreaty they would, he would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Now then the reason they were able to do that, verse 5, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave themselves unto God, or unto the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. They had truly given themselves to God, and based upon their giving themselves to God, they realized, we need to give. Here is a, a work that needs to be done, and we're going to give, and so even though they are in deep poverty themselves, they gave. And they gave not to their power, not to their ability, but beyond their ability. A lot of times, some people think, well, I don't have a lot to give, so I'm not really expected to. No, that's not the case. These Macedonian brethren didn't have much to give. And they gave not only what they should have given, but then they went beyond that. When we give ourselves to God and we recognize this is what's important, spiritual matters, doing what God wants us to do, that's where true Christianity resides. But time, not only money, but time. Do we rob God of our time in gathering for worship on the first day of the week? Bible class. Worship service for us at 10 and at 1. Next week, all Monday through Thursday, 7 o'clock. Are we going to steal from God our time? Or are we going to give time to God? In our worship, in our serving God. 
But what about in our private Bible study? It's long been talked about and discussed that, you know, if all of the Bible study that you receive is here in the worship services, you're going to starve to death spiritually. So in our private Bible study, which we need to be doing, do we really do that or do we steal from God that Bible study that we are expected to do? What about doing the work that's associated <coughs> the work that's associated with the church? Do we do those things? Or do we steal from God in that time that we could be giving to God and the work of the church? Do we become so busy with the cares of this world and the business of this world and the things of this world that we just simply don't have time for God nowadays? I know of parents that literally run from this thing to this thing to this thing to this thing and they are running so much and so long that they don't have time for anything other than taking kids to this activity and that activity and the kids are literally worn out at the end of each day because they've been run around so much. And you try to squeeze God into that, well, there's not time for it. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to take kids here, and I've got to take them there, and we've squeezed God out of, out of our lives. We've stolen that time that He deserves in our life for the cares of this world. I mentioned one other aspect, and that's titles. How we, do we see, or we do see, a stealing of titles? The head of the church. How many times do we hear that in relationship to the Pope Rome? He's the head of the church. He has stolen that title from our Lord, who is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, 18. But yet, the Pope says, why, we're, I'm the head of the church. Now, which one is it? The Pope has stolen the title. He's a thief. Denominations have their earthly headquarters here, you know, located at this place or that place. What happens? They have done exactly the same thing that the Pope has tried to do with their being, here's the head of the, this church. Well, it might be the head of that church, but it's certainly not the head of the Lord's church. Because the head of the Lord's church is not here upon this earth, it's in heaven. Or he is in heaven. But yet, denominations have their headquarters here upon this earth in an attempt to steal the head of the church. We see preachers all of the time. How many of them, well, I'm Reverend so-and-so, or I'm Father so-and-so, or Pastor so-and-so. And we've t stolen a title. In fact, uh, in the King James Version, there's only one time in which the term reverend is used in the King James Version, and it is used in re relationship to God. And I thought about it a few times, wanting to go up to them and say, Oh, you're God! And see what their reaction would be. Or pastor, of course, pastor is an elder of the church. Now, a preacher could be a pastor, but most of them are not. But to take that title as one's own is to steal the title that is reserved for someone else. Or the term Lord. Jesus is, that, is our Lord. 
Uh, he is Lord of all, Acts 10 and verse 36. Uh, I think it's interesting. Um, in Acts second chapter in Peter's sermon, he concludes that Christ is Lord. And then they were pricked in their hearts. But then in Acts the 10th chapter, when the gospel is taken to the Gentile world, he says that Christ is Lord of all. He's now come to understand he's not just Lord of the Jews, the Israelite nation. He's Lord of everyone. But the question really remains, and why I bring this one up, is do we steal that title from him by the way in which we live? Do we truly allow Christ to be Lord of our life or do we steal that title from Him and we become Lord of our life? If we are Lord of our life, then He's not. If we're Lord of our life, then we have stolen that title from Christ as being true Lord. The only way we can allow Him to be Lord is to submit to His will. In becoming Christian through our faith, repenting of our sins, making confession of our faith, and yes, being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But then we're raised from that grave of baptism to live according to the precepts that He sets forth, to submit ourselves to Him and to truly glorify God through Christ. And if you haven't done that as a child of God, but you lived for self and you've allowed self to take that reign, that lordship within your own mind and within your own life, then why not turn your life to Him and submit to His will in everything that you do? If we can help you in that, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.